Greetings everybody and today we're going to be proving the division algorithm. So what exactly is this division algorithm? First of all, let A be some integer and D be some natural number. So these are two numbers that we can choose. Then there exists unique integers Q and R such that we have the following. We have A and we can write A as a Q times D plus R. So A, this is our chosen integer and D, that's our chosen natural number and we can write it as a natural number times another integer plus another integer. And in fact, we want to show that Q and R, these are unique integers and that we also have zero is less than or equal to R, which is strictly less than D. So you might actually recognize this sort of expression over here from primary school, because in primary school, if we say, for example, take 25 and try to divide it by four, well, you know, four goes into 25 six times, but then you have this remainder one. So often in primary school, kids write, well, 25 divided by four is equal to six remainder one. Or you could write it in this form as well. You could express 25 as exactly this Q. Well, what is this Q? It's actually the quotient up here. That's what... Q stands for. We can write it as a six times four. So 25 and four, those are the two numbers you choose. You choose this 25, you choose this four, and we have unique integers six over here, and then plus the remainder, which is one, and those two are unique. And as you can see, R is between zero and D, well, which in this case is six. So this R over here, let's just label this a little bit. R, this is the remainder. And D over here, you might have also heard the name divisor. So D is the divisor. And A, this is also called the dividend, which is the thing you're trying to divvy up. So you have the dividend, we have the quotient, we have the divisor, and we have this remainder. And also that the remainder is between zero and the divisor. Okay, and I just want to provide a little picture as well, just to help visualize the proof a little bit. So let's say this is the number line over here, and let's say this is a zero. And let's put down this A, now A could be negative or positive, doesn't really matter. Let's say this is our A right over here. So A is a number we choose, D, that's also a number that we choose. And how does this all represent it on a picture? It's simply how many of these little intervals of length D you can fit between zero and A. So here, these intervals are of length D over here. And the question is how many of them can you fit in? Well, in Q at the moment, and then we also got this little remainder over here, which is R. And as you can see, it's pretty obvious from this picture, R has to be less than D. Um, now, if it was D or if it was greater than D, then you would be able to fit another one of these little line segments in. So this is the picture, which hopefully will help with the proof later on. So first of all, how do we prove this? So let's jump to the proof. What we want to do, first of all, is somehow define this R over here. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to consider all these points over here that are between these intervals and we're going to package them all up into one set and the idea is we're going to choose the smallest elements in that set which we call r so if we think about all these points over here as being elements of the set it keeps going up and up and up here as well then we want to put all these points into one set which i'll call s so first of all consider a set s over here and we're going to define the set s to be all the numbers a minus a qd such that Q is some integer. So A and D we choose, Q this is an integer that can vary, uh, but we also have the extra condition that A minus QD is positive. And why do we want this restriction for it to be positive? Well, it's because we're after this little element R over here. And R, we only want it to be positive. So that's why we restrict the set this way. So what is the set? It's just all these points, uh, these little dots that I drew over here. Now, the idea is now we want to choose the smallest element in this set. And there's a principle called the well-ordering principle, which states that any subset of the positive integers can be ordered. And if it can be ordered, then there's always going to be a least element. So this is clearly a subset of the positive integers because we have this restriction, which means that this set over here has a least element. And I want to call that least element R, which is this little point right over there. Now, in order to show that this has a least element, S must not be empty. So to show that S is not empty, there's two cases we need to consider. First of all, what happens if A is positive and what happens if it's negative? So to show that S is not empty, we consider two cases Case one over here, A is greater than or equal to zero. Now what happens if A is greater than or equal to zero? Well, we simply let this Q over here be equal to zero. So let Q be equal to zero. 
And what we get is simply A. And since A, we assumed it to be positive, well, then it belongs in this set. So A is in this set. Uh, so S is not empty. Okay, what's the second case over here? Case two, that's when A is a less than zero. Now what happens if A is less than zero? Well, we need to be able to construct an element that lies in this set. And that's very easy to do. We can simply let, there's actually many examples, but we can just simply let Q be equal to A. And what happens then? We're going to get an element of the form A minus, this Q turns into an A, so it's an AD. And we can rewrite this as A times one minus D. And now notice we assumed A to be negative. So this guy is less than zero. What was D? D was a natural number over here. And if you have one minus a natural number, this is always less than or equal to zero. So since we have this element over here, which we can write as a product of two negative numbers, this is going to be greater than or equal to zero. So what did we do? We constructed an element of this set um, and it lies in the set because it's greater than or equal to zero. So again, we can, I guess, put at the very end, therefore S is not empty. And since it only contains positive integers over here, what we can say is that it has a least element. So S has a least element. And then we're gonna call this R. So the next thing we're gonna show is that R has to be between zero and D. So first of all, it's pretty clear that R is greater than zero because if it's not greater than zero, then it's automatically not in this set because this set is only positive. So all that remains to be shown is that R is strictly less than D. So I drew up this picture over here and it should somewhat make sense as to why R has to be less than D because if we were greater than D, let's say this point here, that was our R, then we would be able to fit in another one of these intervals and that R which we thought was the least element wouldn't even be the least element anymore. It would be the one right below it. So that kind of restricts R to be less than D, otherwise it wouldn't be the least element to begin with. So let's show this mathematically now. So we're going to show that R is less than D and we're going to do this by contradiction. Okay, so what do we do? We assume first of all the negation of this statement. So assume R is greater than or equal to D now. Now if R is greater than or equal to D, then we have that R minus D is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, but we actually know what R is. R is the least element. So in particular, we can replace R with this expression A minus QD. So this was originally our R for some Q. And then we still have this minus D. So we have R minus D over here. And this we can write for some Q in Z. But we can actually rewrite this as A minus Q plus a one times D. And why is this nice over here? This element that we just wrote down, this is actually an element in S. Now, why is this guy an element in S? Well, it's, it's of the form A minus integer times D, A minus integer times D. And it's also greater than or equal to zero over here because this expression is equivalent to R minus D, which is already greater than zero. So this guy lies in S. So if this guy lies in S over here, that means R minus D, which was basically what it was, lies in S as well. So this implies that R minus D lies in S. Okay, but notice D over here, we assumed that D was a natural number. So R minus the natural number, well, it's simply less than itself. So what we can say is that R minus D is less than R. But as you can see over here, this is a bit of a contradiction because R minus D, this is an element in S and it's clearly less than R, but we already assumed R was the least element. So in fact, if R is greater than or equal to D, then it's not even the least element to begin with. There was another one that was less than it. So hence we have a contradiction over here. So R has to be less than Z. All right, so we've set aside this condition over here. And the last thing that we need to show is that this works for unique integers Q and R. So we need to show that there, there can't be two other integers Q and R that satisfy the same property over here. This is unique. So to show uniqueness over here, what we need to do is to assume that there's actually another Q prime and another R prime where this expression works. And we need to end up showing that in fact, Q is equal to Q prime and R is equal to R prime. So suppose um, there exists another such Q prime and R prime, which are also integers such that we have A is equal to Q prime D, plus R prime, and that zero is less than or equal to R prime is less than D. Okay, we assume the existence of two other integers. Now we want to show that Q prime is equal to Q and R prime is equal to R. How do we do that? Well, first of all, 
I'm going to make a little assumption, and this is without loss of generality over here, we're going to assume that this R prime is greater than or equal to R. So if it's not, we'll just switch the labels around or something. So this is an assumption we can make, doesn't impose any restrictions or whatever. Now if this is equal to A, and this expression over here is also equal to A, then what we can do is we can write Q times D plus R is equal to Q prime D plus R prime. So these expressions are equivalent. Okay, now I'm going to subtract Q prime D on both sides and subtract R on both sides. And what we'll get is that Q D minus Q prime D is equal to R prime minus R. Okay, now we can factor out a D. So Q minus Q prime times D is equal to R prime minus R. And now on the right hand side over here, Notice that r prime minus r, well, first of all, it's greater than zero because of this assumption we made. And furthermore, because r prime is between zero and d, and this r over here is also between zero and d, the difference must be at most d. So if you added these two, for example, then you could have r prime plus r be greater than d, but because you're subtracting, it has to be at most d. So we notice that it's bounded below by zero, so r prime minus r, and it's bounded above by d. It can't be equal to d um, because none of these could be d to begin with, and it can't be greater than d. And notice on the left-hand side that this is simply a multiple of d because this bracket, q minus q prime, this is an integer. So we have an integer multiple of d. So what exactly is an integer multiple of d? Well, it could be something like minus 2d, comma minus d, comma 0, comma d, comma 2d. Those are all integer multiples of d over here. And on the right hand side, what do we have? This must also be well, an integer multiple of d. Now, here's the problem this r prime minus d can't be equal to d. So we have to ignore all the integer multiples that are to um, the right of d, including d itself, because well, this can't be equal to d. And this r prime minus i is also greater than or equal to zero. So we ignore everything that's negative over here. And what are we left with? We're left with a zero. So in fact, for this expression to work over here, if r minus r prime is an integer multiple of d, it has to be equal to zero. So what this implies is that r prime minus r is equal to zero, but this immediately implies that r prime is equal to r. And since the right hand side is equal to zero, the left hand side must also be equal to zero. But notice a d, d was simply a natural number, which means d can't be zero, which means by the null factor law, q minus q prime must then be equal to zero, since d isn't zero. So q minus q prime is equal to zero, and that tells us that q prime is equal to q. So what did we show over here? r prime is equal to r, q prime is equal to q. So in fact, these numbers q and r are in fact unique. And that actually finishes the proof for the division algorithm. So what did we show? We showed that for any a that we pick out of the integers and for any d that we pick out of the natural numbers, there are unique integers q and r which satisfy these two conditions over here. So that's pretty much all for this video. I hope you guys enjoyed and I'll see everyone in the next one.